Welcome, friends, to this afternoon session of our monthly meeting. Very happy to see you again. I hope you had some good snacks. I enjoyed some. Good for my, my belly, see. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I have a good big meal, and then I'm supposed to talk to people and say, eat less. <laughs> I really can't speak. <laughs> One thing I decided long ago in my sharing of my experiences and opinions, I will never be a hypocrite. If I don't have an experience, I cannot tell you to have it. So that is why if I eat too much, I can't tell you not to eat. There was a holy man in India and he was famous that he could persuade children, small children, to do whatever he said. In one family, one mother had a problem with her child. He was eating too much candy and sugar. She would hide the candy, hide sugar in the kitchen, to go and find it and eat it. So he had skin problems, pimples, whatever. So he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen to doctors. So she heard about that holy man who said, who was famous for telling children, don't do it, they won't do it. So she took that child to that holy man and she said, my child takes too much sugar, please tell him not to take it. <coughs> holy man looked at the child and said, bring him after one week. Then she came back after one week. And the holy man looked at the child again and said, please don't eat sugar. And the child stopped eating sugar. She was very impressed at the power of this holy man over a child. But then she said, why did he make me wait if all he had to do was to tell the child? So she went back to him. She said, sir, you asked my child to stop taking sugar. He has stopped taking sugar. But you could have said that the very first time I brought him to you, he said, if I had said to him that day, he would not have stopped taking sugar because I was taking sugar by that time. I stopped taking sugar for a week before I could tell the child to stop taking. Our words are not effective if they're hypocritical. If they're genuinely coming from experience, they go deep into a person's heart, soul, deeper than the mind. So that is why when I discovered, I said, if I am going to share these experiences, which is part of a seva service given to me by my master, Guru Maharaj Baba Swavan Singh, it's a great privilege to do any service for a master like that. So I said, but I cannot just share teachings unless I first practice myself and have experience. Now when I talk to you, in the morning I talk to you, they made it look so simple. Just go inside, where the problem? Find yourself. Just contemplate. Close your eyes. I made it look so simple. I must tell you, I spent a whole life, my entire life, to find that answer to this. It's not easy. It's not easy because we are so entrenched in the reality of this world. It's very difficult to pull ourselves from this. The distractions are so many. Pull us up. But the way I explained in the morning that this is simple, the whole truth is inside you, go inside. The way I said it, there was no need for a guru in that way. No master is needed for that. Where does the master come in? All I said was go within yourself, it's all a matter of you and your own self. How does an intervention of a third person come in? Somebody actually asked me. You say, God is inside. I said, yes, God is inside. You go and find him. He says, why do I need an agent of God outside to go inside myself? I don't need a guru or somebody. Very reasonable. This whole morning, what I discussed with you, there was no mention of any real guru. In fact, I was saying that these are religions are founded and they are virtually making us live more outside than inside. Where does a guru come in? I want to now tell you where a guru comes. And who is a guru? Who is a master? Who is a 
master and who is a perfect living master. There is a difference. There are thousands of gurus roaming around today, all over the world. I have met so many of them. Several hundred I have met myself. It's a big business. It's a good business. People make good money out of it. But the real gurus who are giving us what a word guru stands for, guru, the removal of darkness. The one who removes our darkness and gives us the light of who we really are. Such a master will always tell us to go within ourselves and find. Now, he is an outside person. But since he has had that experience, when he says it, it appeals to us and we can go inside. Before we will listen to such a guru, something inside us must say, I want to know who I am. I want to know the truth. I don't want to believe anything. I just want to see for myself. That seeking inside must come first. When the seeking comes, surprisingly, when we have a seeking, a guru appears in our life by circumstances, by coincidence. The seeking seems to be connected with the appearance of our guru in our life. That is why they say in India, when a chela is ready, a guru appears. They don't say when a chela is ready, he can find a guru. It's very difficult to find a guru. Because so many people say they are gurus. They pretend to be gurus. They are in a business. And they say the same things that gurus will say. Therefore, there is no way for us to find out who is a real guru. Very difficult. Almost impossible. I don't think anything is really impossible, but this is almost impossible for a human being to find a real guru. But if he is a real guru, he should be able to find us. And that's what happens. When we are ready, with our seeking, insight, a guru appears by coincidence in our life. We can't even sometimes explain how it happened. A series of coincidences can take place and such a person appears. Now, when a master, a real guru appears, he tells us the truth lies inside you, not outside. So he performs an important function of telling us where to look for, gives us the right direction. Because we were looking outside, we were looking for some places, libraries, temples, churches, places outside. He tells us, look inside. So as a human being, as a friend of ours, he is helpful. Then he can tell us different methods of holding attention inside. Because when we try to hold attention inside, the distractions of the world are so many, the mind thinks of all other things except what is inside. So he teaches us some simple methods of how to hold attention inside, which actually is simple. He says, think of something inside. Okay, when you try to think of something inside, you think of outside. All right, I'll tell you another way. I'll give you some words to repeat. And he gives them some strange, funny words to repeat. He says, this is a mantra. He makes it sanctified. This is a mantra. Keep on repeating in your head. We start repeating, not knowing it's just a trick. A trick for the mind. That when you repeat and put attention on what you are repeating, that time you cannot think of other things. This is merely a way of squeezing out your thoughts. And he gives a simple method. Okay, keep on repeating. Make it very sacred because you've gone through the background of religion. So when you sanctify words, they become even more important. And if you take some of the words from some spiritual literature, they become even more sacred for us. And we say, yes, the words have the power. Therefore, we are able to have this simple method of squeezing the words of thought with artificial words put into our thought stream. Then he gives other ideas. You can imagine I am there, imagine I, uh, something else is there, imagine sounds are ringing inside, and sounds can be heard inside. He is telling all the methods so that we can hold attention inside. But he is saying, do it and see the result. So we work hard. This is called the path of effort. That we have to make an effort according to the Guru's direction so that we can find who is inside, who we are. 
But there is a point where we cannot make an effort anymore. And most of the gurus, almost 99% that I have met, only teach you how to make effort and how to do it, how to meditate, how to pull your attention inside. But when you pull your attention inside, it's with the mind. All effort is made with the mind. And we want to find what is beyond the mind. Who runs the mind? What is consciousness that gives life to the mind and to the body and to senses? What's pure consciousness of ours? Pure life. What is life that is giving mind its life, that is giving our body its life and making the whole thing function? That is not the mind. How can we go beyond the mind? How can we make an effort which is always made with the mind and go beyond the mind? The teachings of these gurus stop there. They can also give levels that you can go and see your imaginative self inside, you can have an out-of-body experience, you can fly. They can do those things. But they cannot take us beyond the mind. Then, if we are not satisfied, if we are satisfied with the experiences, it's a done deal. That's what we wanted, the guru has given us. If we are not satisfied, we feel there is more to learn. I haven't found what I wanted to find. When this seeking comes in us, that seeking goes beyond mental seeking. It's a spiritual seeking. That is true spiritual seeking comes from the soul. It's an intuitive seeking. When that seeking comes in us, then a different kind of guru appears in our life. We call him a perfect living master. Param Sant Sadguru the one who is beyond the mind. Such a person comes into our life like an ordinary person. Not glorifying himself by many special robes or special titles or something, which the other gurus can do. Because we need directions from somebody we can recognize and follow their directions and make an effort. But when a perfect living master comes into our life, he's just an ordinary person like us. We see him born like us, eating food like us, falling sick like us, going to hospital like us, and doing nothing different from us, having a karma like ours, absolutely like us. Sometimes even more ordinary than us. And such a person appears in our life. And there is a certain pull that we feel toward that person. And the mind cannot fully explain why we are having that feeling? Why are we being pulled to that person? When that person teaches us something or has a conversation with us, we feel he knows us something that others don't know. He tells us sometimes casually in friendship a few things which we wonder how does he know? How can he know that? And we say, how do you know that? He said, no what? I don't know anything. This remains his ordinary self. But something keeps on happening within us which says, what is our relationship with him? And it's a pull which sometimes the mind resists. The mind argues against it. The mind says, don't be carried away by this thing. But the pull keeps on increasing. And we can't even explain why that pull is there. Why are we trying to see that person? Why do we feel happy to see that person? These things keep on happening in us. Such a person is pulling us from soul to soul and skipping, bypassing the mind. And we don't realize that because we are thinking with our mind, why, what is happening? We can't explain it. Such a person remains ordinary and becomes our friend. Other gurus don't become friends. They teach from a pedestal. Such a person, perfectly master, becomes our friend. And we are willing to accept friend is ordinary person like us. It's easy to make a friend. We can't make a friend with a person who is not like us. I, I often give the example. Supposing a guru comes here, flying in the air, and we all look up. You'll forget my talk by the time. <laughs> you say, how is that possible for a man is flying? 
first thought for a person like me will be there must be some strings attached somewhere. I'll try to explain to myself how such a thing can happen. And say maybe some kind of levitation is possible. Maybe he has done some kind of well-known yogas that he can fly in the sky. We will look at him. Some of us will fold our hands. Some of us may worship him. Some of us may be in awe about him. But nobody will be his friend. Nobody. Nobody will love him. If he falls down while doing that, so many of us will run to help him. And first time, some compassion and friendship will come in our life. First love will come. It is only ordinariness of our human being that brings love and friendship together. That is why these perfectly masters come here as our friends, not as teachers. They are not teachers. When our mind wants to learn something and we feel they can teach, we say, all right, and they become teachers temporarily. That's not their job. That's what they come for. There are plenty of teachers. Millions of teachers. Millions of books that can teach you the same thing. Everything that these perfectly masters tell us is all in the books. Written several times. We can read them all, over, all our life and get nothing out of them. They don't come for teaching anything. They come to pull us with their love. Now, that's big secret. Why do they do that? Because love does not come from the mind. Love comes from the soul. How do I know that love comes from the soul and not from the mind? Because I have never seen a person think himself into love. People try it very hard. I want to love, I want to love, I want to love, and they get totally drowned in the argument. But when love pulls, you don't even know where it happened. How have you suddenly fallen in love? is so timeless, spontaneous an experience that thought does not even enter. When you experience love and thought enters, thought creates doubts, thought creates fear, thought destroys love. Thought does not make love or create love. Love comes from the soul, from the spirit. Not only love, even intuition. The knowledge without thought comes from the soul. Even appreciation of beauty that's so sudden, spontaneous, comes from the soul. Even a feeling of being so high, feeling of what they call blissful state, comes from the soul. So there are separate functions. Mind has its own functions. All mental functions, all thinking is in time. The smallest thought takes duration in time. Love, beauty, appreciation, Intuition do not take time. They are beyond time. Therefore, perfect living masters are coming to pull us beyond the mind. No amount of meditation practice can take you beyond the mind. No meditation exists. I have not seen any that can take you beyond the mind. Love can take you beyond the mind. A love that pulls. Now, if a person has come in my life, and I pulled by his love. I was not, that was not my seeking. I was not seeking to be pulled by love by a human being. I was seeking to find my own self. What is the connection between the two? That takes a time for us to discover the connection between the two. That the person we are calling a perfect living master is not really outside. Is inside. It's our own self. Our own self is pulling us. We are not there to be able to feel that. Therefore, it's an expression of our own true self which expresses outside as a human being, as a perfect living master. When we fall in love with a perfect living master, what does he say? He don't say, follow me and come and run with me where we are going. He says, go within yourself. Master, what will I find if I go within myself? You will find me there. True. Master is not outside. It's, it's a symbolic representation of a human being appearing outside of something that is actually inside. When we transcend our mind inside, 
pulled by the love which we think master is now inside pulling us because we can see him inside we can feel him inside we have a conversation with him inside the friend who was outside has become a friend inside just by sitting inside our head when that happens the pull is all inside when we cross the mind we find the master was only an external representation of our own self the self is the real master the ultimate self is the master but we can't see it we can't feel it we are so far away from it therefore he appears outside but the path of going beyond the mind the spiritual path is love and devotion not meditation love and devotion why am i using two words i was describing love and now i brought in devotion also devotion is a normal response to love when you feel the pull of love that kind of divine love that comes it's very different from the attractions we have in physical beings here attractions we have for physical things here which are creating created by attachments that love which is not an attachment when that pulls us it's an amazing experience and we automatically respond to it the response is called devotion It's an automatic thing. We become a devotee and become devoted when we experience that love. Nobody has to teach us. People write to me email, tell me how I can be more devoted. I said, if you are experiencing love, you will be devoted. You like to do everything that the pull is telling you to do. So, love and devotion is the real secret. And perfect living masters come and create that big experience in us. of love and devotion the biggest experience of course is that the master is actually inside but when we see the master inside we discover at the end master and the seeker disciple are one they were never two it's a game it's a whole game of creation whole game of going back and finding the truth there's only one the totality of consciousness is never separated it's not two it's always one it's a united unified one totality of consciousness exists in which the whole drama of creation is taking place not outside of it within it now i use when you use the terms within and outside it looks like space and time not space and time consciousness is the power to be conscious to experience anything and when we experience something we have become conscious of it aware of it and that power to be able to experience anything that you want is the power of totality of consciousness that's our reality that is the true self where the master and the disciple are the same it takes time for us to discover our own reality now when we are going on this exploration of our own self we go step by step because we are so caught up here it takes time for us to ignore the distractions of this life there are so many but once we are able to ignore at least for some time and pull our attention inside it takes time then we have to go and see if anything beyond what we are imagining inside that takes time it can take several lifetimes this exploration of the self is not a hurried quick job because we are living in time and space with events spread out like that this is also spread out like that so we take time to discover ourselves and ultimately finally if our seeking continues we seek the ultimate you will find the ultimate it's as simple as that whatever you seek you will find if you seek worldly comforts you will get those if you seek worldly help you will get that If you want to seek inner knowledge, you will get that. If you want your true home, you get that. If you want to know the self, you get that. If the seeking does not stop halfway, you will keep on going to the top, though it may take time. When you discover that the whole thing is being created within the self, not outside, it's a very big revelation. It gives you answers to all questions ever asked by anybody. because you have all the answers the whole creation sitting inside 
it's very difficult to start with and believe that the world we are seeing outside itself is a projection from our own mind. There is a scientist, a very well-known scientist, he has been head of any scientific community. He has just put up a paper and he has written a paper on what he calls biocentrism. Biocentricism. And he says that the mind, he has not gone beyond the mind, the mind creates all our experiences. He is just actually just adding some more words to the discovery of quantum mechanics, which was done many years ago. When Einstein was able to hint at quantum mechanics and how an electron, to give me a simple example, hydrogen's simplest matter, simplest element, one electron, one positron, neutron, and the electron goes around that pole positron at a distance which we know just by the nature of the gravitational pull we know the distance of the electron from its nucleus but we don't know whether that electron moves like this or like this or this way or a million other combinations that can be created when I studied physics in college in the 40s, at that time they were teaching, they used to draw a circle and they used to put one this electron. If you make it three-dimensional, you can't make it. Where is the electron? Therefore, nowadays when they teach, electron is an energy around. Why? Because if you put a laser beam anywhere at the distance, the electron is there. That means electron is everywhere. Never yeah, they found out in physics that the electron is everywhere till you put a laser beam anywhere at the distance from the nucleus. But once it is there, with your measurement, your observation, it's nowhere else except it. What does it mean? It means human observation, human measurement can convert energy which is spread out all over into matter which is located at one place. This is the old quantum physics, it's not, nothing new I'm telling you. This was discovered long ago. Now they go on even further. In biocentricism, this physicist says that if this is so, we are converting energy into matter with our observation all the time. That what we are looking at the world as a matter is it really being converted by observation of human beings. But then he also examines whether such a wonderful statement was said by something, somebody else. And he found Buddha said it thousands of years ago. Zen Buddhists are saying it even today. So he examines in his paper, which you can see on YouTube now. In, in his paper he is examining that how come these statements were made so long ago and we scientists took so long to understand it that the whole thing is coming from human observation. That it's a human. Now he's only going to the brain, human mind, and the possibility of creating everything from there. If he goes a little beyond into consciousness and not the brain, he'll find out consciousness creates everything. But when we want to discover ourselves, we go stage by stage, step by step, which means if we want to have a nice dream, we have to sleep. You can't have a dream while you are awake. Up, awake. It will be a daydreaming. It's not like real going somewhere where you don't even know that that's not your reality. When you are awake, you know dream being is not real. Which is the dream that's real. To create reality, we have to sleep somewhere, become unaware of some level of awareness. Same thing is true of every level of awareness. So when we move and we draw our attention inside to find the truth inside, we have to become unaware of the physical awareness. Then the other one opens up. It's like waking up. Oh, then we realize the physical reality was not really real. Now what we've got is real. When we come back to this reality, that looks so clear. Lucid dream. Was it a dream or was it more real? We can't even answer because this has become real now. When we go back into sleep at night and have another dream, that dream again becomes real. That means it is not a question of progressively knowing something more. 
It's just you alter your state of awareness and wherever your level of awareness is, you make that your reality. So reality is merely an experience at one level of wakefulness. So when we go from one level of wakefulness, from dream to wakeful, wakeful to higher wakeful, astral wakeful, causal wakeful, we discover that was, was the real one, all others were like dreams. But what happens if you transcend all this and discover your own self totality of consciousness? Then you discover that all these dreams were being made there. All of them. Therefore, one who has had that experience is experiencing all levels at the same time. That's a big difference between an enlightened person and a perfect living master. A perfect living master has reached the state that he is actually aware of every level of experience. Dream stage, wakeful stage, astral stage, causal stage, spiritual stage, total stage, at all times, no matter at which level he is operating, he is operating at all levels. So, now we see a human being, he is a perfect living master, his awareness is at that level. When he sits with us and talks to us, he is talking not by trying to remember what he saw in his meditation, he is talking what he is experiencing right there. We can all have the same state, that we can experience all these states at once provided we reach the top. Any level below that, we will have only one reality and the others will become unreal. When we reach the top, all are unreal and all are real. All are real experiences, all are unreal as an objective reality. Now, one has to remember that experience is always real. Sometimes we, we are misled by somebody saying, Oh, this world is illusion. What are you looking at? Unreal stuff. And we say, how can it be unreal? I'm looking at it. So are you telling me I'm not looking at it? I am looking at it. Somebody says, oh, this glass of water you've got is not real. It's illusion. You're not having anything. And I hold it in my hand and drink. The... Mm. It tastes so good. Who can tell me it's not real? I had a real experience of holding a real glass and had a real taste in my mouth. Nobody can deny it because I had the experience. What is not understood is the experience was real. It's always real. There's no illusion about the experience. Illusion is that this experience can be created by a glass that is not real. By water that is not real. How do we know that? I can have a dream tonight, in the dream I'm talking to you, and I have a glass right here, exactly the same thing in a dream, and I am saying, this glass, is it real or not? And somebody says, no, no, you're, it's not real. It's real, I do the same thing I just did, and then I wake up. I remember, I did drink the water. Experience was real, glass was not. Therefore, when we say this word is illusion, the word illusion is not actually totally appropriate. They use the word maya in Indian language. They say maya, they translate as illusion. Maya is deeper than that. It means a real experience can create a real objectivity of things outside. That means you can have a real experience of a glass, real experience of drinking water, and you therefore jump to the conclusion there has to be an objective glass to have it. Every day dreams prove to us that is not true. But when it happens here, this is our reality, we have to take it as real. So the objective creation of something outside of ourselves, that becomes real because the experience is real. Amazing way to set up this reality, except of creation. What an amazing way to set up a whole huge creation of billion, trillions of universes, all from consciousness and all verifiable. And what I am saying is not merely a theoretical model or a guesswork, all verifiable by anyone who is seeking to verify it by going within. I am very happy to share this with you, great masters, when 
they come perfectly with master, like this master of mine, they become our friends. Their love is unconditional. Big difference between their love and the love we normally experience, which is attachment. What's the difference between attachment and love? Very simple words. In attachment, you are always conscious of two. I and you. I love you. What is my awareness saying? There is me, there is you. And we love each other. Who is more prominent in that statement? I love you. I or you? I first. Why? I love you. Supposing you say, I don't love you. What happens to me? Disappointment in I. Then I don't love you either. I, the ego of the mind, the face of the mind is dominant in attachments. I love my house. I love my car. I love you. I love my children. I love my parents. I love my friends. I love you. All the time you're loving I. More than any of these things. This is just, but when you have real love, what happens? You suddenly fall in love with somebody, a beloved, pulls your attention to the extent you forget the I. You don't think of I. You just look at the beloved, the mind, the space where I is operating. The I is pushed back. The beloved takes that place. That's true love. That kind of love you can experience when it comes from a higher level than the mind. So when perfectly we masters give us that strange experience of love, it's not coming from the mind, not from the body, not from the senses. It's coming from the soul, from beyond the mind. And that is why it affects us in a certain way. And that is the secret. That love will eventually pull us there. And we become devoted. Love and devotion is the secret of true spirituality. Thank you very much for listening to me and I hope to see you again next month. I'll see people who have never seen me before now and a few other people who I have given time. Thank you.